Well, hello. Welcome to my studio here in fabulous Las Vegas. We are continuing on with our explication of the test specifications. Uh, I highly recommend you go to the NASA website and print the PDF, not only for this journey, but for your journey through the exam. And uh, what we're doing is uh, providing you with what we hope is an intellectual inventory. We finished up the explication of the SIE and the Series 7, and we're working our way uh, through the NASA exam. Uh, we're on valuation factors, uh, fixed income securities. And so uh, this is the test specification document. If you find this, you can follow along. I always want to distinguish my comments from those of the actual document itself, the NASA PDF document. And so usually I try and do that in a different color. I get sometimes where I don't do that, but uh, that's my, my goal. All right, so one of the concepts that uh, you encounter on NASA exams that doesn't show up in FINRA exams is this concept of duration. I think you'd be fine on your exam to think of uh, duration as just volatility. If every time you saw the word duration, you said volatility, I think you'd be fine. But what you might wanna do is you might wanna make up a flashcard and have flashcards next to you as you go through these explications of the test specifications or make a note. And so duration, the definition of what it is, is a measure of sensitivity or volatility of a bond's change to interest rates. You know, a lot of practitioners of uh, modern portfolio theory and higher math uh, get upset sometimes when, uh, you know, not only myself, but, uh, you know, most providers use a teeter-totter or a seesaw to show you that relationship of interest rates and bond prices, that inverse relationship. And one of the biggest gripes they have about it is that it's not really that way. It's not linear. It's more of a curvature. There's more convexity, if you will, to it. But anyways, I, I just would know that that's a nonlinear relationship. And this isn't as difficult as a test issue or test question performance opportunities you might think. In fact, if I were a test taker, I'd look forward to a, a duration question. Because a duration just is, again, is a measurement of volatility. So the higher the duration, uh, the more the bond will drop with a move in interest rates and has more volatility. And what I would probably want you to know is it's easy to get these right because you're just going to shop the answer set. And what you're looking for, they say, which bond has the highest duration? Now, read carefully because I had a guy on a coaching call yesterday. He, he missed the little, least likely, most likely. So it'd be the reverse, right? But wait, remember, it's long and low. So the one that's gonna have the most volatility, if they ask you about the higher duration, is you're just gonna champ, ch chop the answer set. And you're first gonna look for the longer maturity or longest maturity in the answer set. And then you're gonna look for the, uh, uh, the longest maturity and the lowest coupon. And that would be the bond that would have the higher duration or higher volatility. Uh, yield to call. Well, as an investment advisor representative, when you're uh, buying bonds into your customer's portfolio. Uh, one of the things you need to know is if you buy a bond at a premium, what you're gonna be interested in is yield to call because at a bond at a premium, it's likely the bond's gonna get called. Let me get my different color here. Likely that it's gonna be called because interest rates have gone down. That's what's caused the bond to be at a premium. And the bond at a premium is likely to be called and that means you would not be able to hold it to maturity. You know, I had a student and uh, again, you know, malicious or ignorant, I it was not, not malicious, but she was showing me uh, a bond portfolio she was gonna recommend as an investment advisor representative. And, you know, I don't know, again, kind of new, but what she had was all the coupons, all the nominal yields, all the fixed income that the customer was gonna receive. But, you know, uh, those coupons looked nice and juicy and they were, and they were higher than today's uh, current bonds in the primary market. And they were all trading at a, a premium. And I said, well, listen, you might wanna put a column there on the far right where you show people what yield to call is because I doubt they're gonna be able to keep all those bonds to maturity. The vast majority of the bonds you're showing them in this you know, hypothetical recommendation are bonds that are likely to get called and that would be the lowest yield. So in a bond at a premium, we would uh, quote the yield to call or as a, you know, an investment advisor representative. Now the test assumes that on this exam, you have a trading authorization. So it's not so much that you're disclosing as a to the customer, it's that you're gonna actually be doing these things. And so it's on you now to know that when you buy a bond at a premium or the bond is trading at a premium, that that's likely to be called. Now, in terms of uh, bonds that are trading at discount or par, discount or par, you know, there is some overlap. So this uh, should be familiar to you 
if you recently just passed, you know, another FINRA exam, but if you haven't, then it's, it's new and it's something you need to do. And if you need to, there are plenty of background lectures available for you on the channel. But yield of maturity is what you're interested in as an invest, investment advisor if what you're considering putting into the customer's portfolio is a bond at discount or par, then you would be interested in uh, yield of maturity. Now, the one yield that doesn't change, the one yield that doesn't change is the coupon. You know, the old days bonds physically had coupons. That coupon has a lot of different names. Let's just put it the other names. That's also known as the fixed or stated rate of return. That's also known as the uh, nominal yield. You know, whoop. and that doesn't change, you know. The issuer says, we don't care who bought the bond, what they paid, we're gonna send a check. Now remember the checks are sent some semi-annually. So that coupon, I'll just make up one. Let's get a different color highlighter. You know, let's say it's an 8% bond. You know, I have a lecture, it's called uh, Ford Bond, not James Bond. Ford Bond, not James Bond. Ford Bond, Ford is the issuer, right? So Ford, if it's an 8% bond, says we're gonna pay $80 semi-annually. How'd I get that? I took par. Times 8%. And that's gonna be $80 uh, per bond. And that'll be paid to me semi-annually. So uh, again, kind of head where we're heading here a little bit. Is so if I bought a hundred of these bonds, hundred M, let's hundred M would be a uh, hundred of these thousands times eight percent. We'd be looking at eight thousand dollars in annual interest if we had a block of a hundred of these, and that eight thousand dollars would be paid to us in two semi-annual installment. So if this was a, a ten-year bond. And let's say it's a 10 year bond. What we'd be looking at is uh, what? Uh, $4,000 uh, twice a year for 10 years. So we'd be looking for 20 uh, payments of $4,000. Now kind of where we're heading here a little bit, right? So if this was an afford 8% debenture, uh, 8% times a thousand, $80 per bond. Uh, I'm gonna buy a hundred of them, put it in my customer's portfolio. We'll assume for purposes of this illustration, it's not callable. And so that means uh, I would expect if I had $100,000, if we lent Ford $100,000, they agreed to pay 8,000 a year, that's gonna be 4,000 January 1st, 4,000 July 1st. And so if it's 10 year bond and they're paying twice, we've got 20 of these payments coming to us. Now, remember from an earlier explication, we said money today is always worth more money than at some future date. And so, you know, the $4,000 I'm receiving six months from today is worth more than the $4,000 I'm receiving, you know, five years from today. And the $4,000 I'm receiving five years from today is worth more what I'm receiving, more than what I'm receiving uh, eight years from today. So anyways, that coupon doesn't change as we said, uh, so that, whatever that number is. Now, uh, conversion valuation. Uh, one more thing up here. I forgot to put in. Let me get a different color here. Now I say, listen, you're going to get a uh, uh, statement every uh, quarter, quarterly statements. That's a test question. And, you know, if interest rates go up, uh, the bonds are going down. We just talked about duration. But one way we can make our uh, customers immune from that test term, immune, as I say, listen, that whole thing about volatility is if you're participating in the secondary market. And if we don't participate in that secondary market, if we just buy the bonds and we don't ever sell them, we just hold a maturity, we'd be immune from that fluctuating interest rate. And so, you know, maybe you get a question that goes something like, how would you uh, immunize a customer's bond portfolio from what we're discussing? And you'd say, well, we're just not going to participate in the secondary market. We're just going to buy the bonds and hold them to maturity. Anyways, I apologize for that. I wanted to back up and you know, click take care of that before we move on. All right, so uh, back to the sequence we're in right now, which is talking about uh, the valuation. Remember the big picture here, what we're doing in this explication 
is valuation factors of fixed income securities. And we're just literally going through the test specifications and uh, you know flushing these things out. A conversion valuation. So remember, if we have a convertible bond, we can switch our status from being a bondholder to becoming an owner. Let me get a different color here. And so that conversion uh, features, the conversion features are uh, based on par. And so uh, really important if you're going to get a conversion, if you're going to put a convertible bond into your uh, customer's portfolio as an investment advisor representative, that you're clear about what the conversion ratio is. And so, for example, if I told you that the uh, bond had a conversion uh, price of 40, you know, what you got to be able to do is you got to be able to turn that into a conversion ratio. And so the way we're going to do that is we're going to take par, because again, everything is based on the original issuance when the bond was issued. So we're going to take par and, and we're going to divide by the conversion uh, price, which in this case is 40. And when we do that, we get the conversion ratio of 25 shares. Uh, listen, you don't want to give up any math questions. So, uh, you know, I'm just going to take my calculator, just make sure I did that math, the arithmetic. You know, wouldn't that be sad to mess up on a, what should be a simple arithmetic question? So 1,000 uh, divided by 40, indeed 25 shares. Now, what I have to be able to do as an investment advisor representative is know that if I convert that, what would it look like, right? So, you know, maybe I'm considering, again, let me get a different color here. Uh, maybe the current market price, the current market price of the convertible is, uh, 1,300 or 30 in bond speak, that'd be 1,130, but 1,300 bucks. And, you know, I'm uh, thinking, okay, well, if I put this uh, convertible bond uh, into my customer's portfolio at $1,300 and I convert it, you know, what would we be paying for the stock? You know, because I want to kind of look at that stock price and kind of see where that conversion uh, feature is going to make some sense. And so the way we do that to figure out, that's called parity, by the way. And I want to see what the uh, stock price is the equivalent of paying for this bond. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take $1,300, the current market price of the convertible. That's given information. I'm going to divide by the number of shares we can get. And, uh, you know, we end up getting what we call parity. And in this example, uh, parity would be $52 a share. Now, the point is when I get $52 a share, as parity of the stock. Now, I still may want to buy the bond in the secondary market at 1,300, but I'd be paying $52 for the stock if I convert based on that price. That's typically trading at a premium to parity of the bond. I'm showing you parity of the stock, but you know, parity of the bond is probably you know, a little less than that. In fact, maybe uh, I say that the current market price of the stock Uh, current market price, CMP means current market price is $50 per share. So again, doesn't mean I'm not going to buy that bond. It just means I should probably pay attention to, you know, that current market price. So uh, we're hoping here that it would go up another, uh, you know, uh, $2 a share. And then remember, I should understand that at the very end, the, uh, the issuer is going to say, do you want X number of shares, 25 shares, or do you want, you know, your thousand dollars back? So you know, what's kind of cool about this, right, is you can switch your status. You can switch your status from being a creditor of the issuer to becoming an owner. All right, so uh, bond ratings. You know, there's two types of risk in bonds. The two uh, risks in bonds are interest rate risk, which we kind of talked about when we talked about duration, right? This idea that interest rates go up, bond prices go down, interest rates go down, the bond goes up, then perhaps it gets called. Uh, so you have interest rate risk and you also have credit risk. 
And so the ratings are about credit risk. And, you know, you are held accountable for as an investment advisor representative, you know, you have three uh, issuers of debt denominated securities you're held accountable for as an investment advisor representative. Those are the U.S. government, uh, municipalities, and corporations. Now, the only uh, issuer that where there is no credit risk is the U.S. government. But, you know, uh, corporations and municipalities are going to be rated. And the one they like more often than not on the test is a standard of pours. And triple B is less than as uh, investment grade. And uh, less than triple B is less than investment grade. And that just means you're gonna have more credit risk the further you go down in those ratings, right? You know, uh, I could be, I haven't checked this in a while, but the only two corporate issuers with triple A credit quality according to Standard Poor's are Microsoft and Johnson and Johnson. So, you know, if I sell you Microsoft or Johnson and Johnson, is there credit risk? Yes, but it's not as much as if I sell you uh, those Ford Motor Company debentures, uh, the Ford bonds, I think they're triple B, uh, which means they're investment grade, but they're you know certainly more risky than uh, Microsoft or Johnson & Johnson. And that, that's kind of what that credit spread is about. The yeah, credit spread is the difference between what high quality bonds pay. Let's put that in there. and a low, quality, low credit quality bonds pay. You know, in terms of, uh, you know, analysis or valuation, you may be watching, might watch the, the difference between that credit spread uh, uh, move up and, uh, you know, widen or narrow. So it's the difference between what high quality bonds pay, let's put difference. And low credit bond pay. And, you know, if we're watching that uh, difference, the credit spread, and perhaps we see uh, that it's widening or narrowing. So credit spread is widening. You know, that usually means that, uh, you know, in terms of economics, right, that people are not as uh, comfortable with the economy and they're selling their uh, lower credit quality bonds, causing the price to go down and yields to go up and buying high credit quality bonds, causing the price to go up and the yield to go down. And so, you know, kind of a negative outlook on the economy when that money is moving. You know, my economics lecture, uh, I titled it after what Lord John Maynard Keynes said about money. He said, money's like a giant floating crap game. It's always going from one place to another, right? So we're watching this uh, credit spread. We're watching the money in motion, so to speak, you know, uh, between what, what people are willing to do. Right now, the spread has been narrowing and that means the uh, difference between what high credit quality bonds and low credit quality bonds uh, means people are comfortable. They're comfortable holding the, uh, the uh, lower credit quality bonds. Now the test, we never use the word junk because one man's junk is another man's treasure, but less than investment grade is junk. But credit spread is narrowing. That means people are comfortable uh, about the economy, they have a positive outlook on the economy. All right, so again, these are explications. They're not lectures. I'm not going to a lecture of economics. All right, so discounted cash flow. Now, you're not going to make have to do discounted cash flow on your exam because you can see here, I you know, I've got showed you what it looks like. Um, you know, I gave you an example of that bond, right? We were had $100,000 of Ford Motor Company debentures. They're paying 8%. That's $8,000. we are getting $4,000 every six months. And so we know that we're going to get... Uh, 10 years, we assumed it was non-callable, so we're gonna get 20 of those uh, payments of $4,000. And so what we're gonna try and do is figure out what is the present value of that uh, money that we're gonna receive, that cash flow. So again, if you have your notes or you have your flashcards, you know, however you're going about this, maybe your margin on the PDF that you printed, you know, what discounted cash flow is a valuation method used to uh, estimate the value of the investment based on its uh, future expected future cash flows. Now that discount rate, by the way, so kind of a test point is know the inputs. I'm not gonna make you do this on the exam or NASA's not gonna make you do it. There's gonna have a general understanding of this. You know, even if they asked you to do it, you couldn't do it because you're getting a simple function calculator that, that can't do this. 
But anyways, what I, I would know is what is one of the inputs is that discount rate you choose to use to do the math, right? And that would be important to figure this out. So, you, you know, you know, everybody has some rationale about why they, you know, choose a particular discount rate, but you know that's one of the inputs and that is not a set thing. That's something you would assume. All right, so if we did all that math, we would come up with a present value number. You know, what do we think the bond is worth? What do we think the Ford Motor Company debentures are worth based on getting, you know, 20 payments of $4,000 over the next uh, 10 years paid to me semi-annually? And, you know, maybe we do the math and uh, we, you know, come up with a net uh, present value number and then we look at the price of the bond. So, and then we're gonna compare that. So for example, as you see here, I gave us a little bit of an example here where we said the cost of the bond is 940 and based on doing the uh, discounted cash flows, uh, we found out that it was 990 is what that bond is worth based on our math and our discount rate. And we see that it's at 940. So we said, wow. So that's a positive net pa uh, present value. So that would be a good thing, right? It's kind of like a, the mythical free lunch. I'm looking at this, I've done the math. The math tells me that based on my discounted cash flow, uh, those future cash flows of my Ford Motor Company debenture, those 20 payments of $4,000 over the next 10 years is worth uh, $990 per bond. And uh, I can get the bond for 94. And so I have a positive net present value and that's a good thing. Now I put buy here, that doesn't mean you're not gonna buy. I'm just trying to em emphasize this is a good thing. By the way, that's what on the test they're gonna ask you to do, not so much buy, but you know, what's a good value, what's a bad value based on doing this math, this discounted cash flow, right? So I put buy here, but you know, it's not necessarily buy, it's just that is a better deal, so to speak, than if we uh, did the math and we found out the uh, present value is 940, the net present value is 900, and now the bond's trading for 940, we say, ooh, that's got a negative uh, net present value, so we wouldn't buy it, or maybe we wait till it moves in our favor, or whatever, but that's uh, not, as good a value. So, you know, the first one here, let's just, uh, let me put it, you know, you know, the way they're gonna make you do here sometimes is like just a comparison between bond A, for lack of imagination, and uh, bond B in terms of the better value, so to speak. So, All right. so. We also use uh, this uh, discounted cash flow, same kind of a deal. So remember, we were looking here at the present value of uh, Ford Motor Company debentures that are paying me $4,000 every six months for the next 10 years. So I'm going to get 20 payments of 10 years twice, uh, 20 payments of $4,000. And we did a discounted cash flow to figure out what that present value was. And then we uh, compared it by subtracting the cost to come up with net present value to decide whether it's a good value or not such a good value. But we could do the same thing with uh, stocks as well. And so we also have another model where we use discounted cash flow, and that's called the dividend discount model. Now, first uh, test point here is the dividend discount map model only works with stocks that pay dividends. But, you know, uh, Mr. Buffett, for example, in 2010 invested uh, in 700 million shares of Bank of America. And, you know, Mr. Buffett's big on this math. He says, okay, you know, I'm going to get these dividends from Bank of America. Let me figure out what these future dividends are worth. He's going to do that. Now, but he'll make an assumption, not testable, whether he's going to get the dividends forever or there's going to be some terminal ending value where he's going to come up with his, his math number. But you know, he says, I give these future payments. Uh, by the way, the dividend is being paid quarterly, if, if at all. And then he, uh, you know, comes up with a number and decides based on that present value again and compares the net present value whether he wants to buy the stock or not. And so we're going to use this as well in stocks. So the, we just went over it in bonds. When we use it in stocks, it's called the dividend discount model. Now, by the way, uh, Bank of America just raised their dividend from 72 cents annually to 84 cents annually. And so we have a, another version of this called the dividend discount growth model. And this makes the assumption that the dividend you're getting is going to rise. And now if you get this on your test as evaluation, uh, let me just put a heading here. This is for uh, valuation of common stocks. 
that pay dividends? And again, kind of a trick question on your exam, perhaps you can't use this model for stocks that don't pay dividends. So this wouldn't work in a growth stock, right? But for a mature stable business that's paying dividends, you know, if we look at uh, Berkshire Hathaway's portfolio, Mr. Buffett likes stocks that pay dividends because he knows he's getting these quarterly payments of these future dividends and he's doing this discounted cash flow we're talking about. Now, now the test question here is which would, uh, uh, what would Mr. Buffett, if he does the math, would he be willing to pay a higher price? And that's the kind of the test issue. Using the dividend discount growth model where we're assuming the dividends are going to rise. Uh, I'll tell you what, let's do this. Um, I wasn't sure if people were gonna find these explications helpful or not. So, you know, these aren't work at I as kind of lectures. I do narrative lectures. And so, you know, kind of doing these on the fly. <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, people find them productive so we'll continue doing them. But anyways, you know, on the fly here, I think what I'm gonna do here is I just wanna put in here what the point, the test point is. And the test point here is that the dividends are constant. What I mean by that is, you know, that dividend you're getting, to do the math, by the way, it's math. The dividends are constant and don't change. And then this one, we're gonna assume, let me get a different color here. The dividends can increase. And that's, you know, but Bank of America said the business was doing well, let's increase our dividends. So uh, here we're assuming that the dividends are going to rise, to go up. And then the takeaway from this is basically that this would justify a higher price. So if we're using the growth model, we're using the growth model, uh, we could uh, justify a higher price. The growth model justifies a higher valuation is the way I would say that, let the growth model justifies a higher valuation. And then remember, I was uh, used to doing a coaching call with a guy. Just be careful. You know, Dean you know, always says RTFQ. Make sure you're reading the question because, you know, we can reverse these answers on you by, you know, saying a lower valuation. So, you know, maybe we can put that a lower valuation than the growth model. I'll say version. Okay, so I've uh, been kind of slow getting some new content up for you, particularly, you know, we've worked our way on the channel. Hey, thanks for your support, by the way. I appreciate it. So, you know, uh, like, subscribe, uh, comment. We're pretty good at getting back. Uh, it's been amazing. I, I didn't know what my expectation would be when I started trying to, uh, you know, establish direct relationships with test takers. And uh, when we started the channel about six months ago, we kind of did it in sequential order, uh, you know, trying to jump in with the cycle of most people's testing. So what I mean by that is uh, we started with SIE content, we built that out. We uh, started with series seven content, we built that out. And uh, now we're finally at the area of NASA where we're building out 63 and 65 and 66 content. And that's, you know, been a little slower than, than I'd like, but you know, it, it is what it is. So uh, we'll continue to make installments until we uh, like SIE, like series seven, we have the entire uh, 65 and 66 and the 63 uh, explicated as well. And then we're always adding new stuff, uh, you know, so make sure you subscribe. We'll have another practice final for the SIE at some point. The next practice final will actually be a practice final for six, series 65 and a practice final for series 66. Uh, that's a ways away because I got to get done with the test specifications. All right, well, uh, like I say, thanks for your support. And I'll see you on the next installment.